Hello everybody, welcome back to Red Tool House. On today's video, I wanna do another land discussion and talk about the difference between a, an easement and a right of way and why it's important to know the difference when it comes to rural land purchase or rural land acquisition. So come along. So in an urban or suburban setting, the right of ways and easement placements and locations of those could be pretty obvious especially in suburban areas where the communities are mapped out clearly. You've got sidewalk easements, you've got roadway easements, you've got right-of-ways for various components there. Those could be easily identifiable and of course very easy to trace. But when it comes to rural settings, sometimes those right-of-ways or easements are a little interesting and may, you may find them in the most peculiar of places. It's helpful to know where they are and any details associated with the easement or right-of-way. Well, first, I think it's important to define the difference between an easement and a right of way, because even I find myself confusing them or overlapping them, using them as synonyms, and that's not particularly the case. An easement is a non-possessory interest in a particular parcel of land. That means they don't actually own the land that the easement is on. An easement can be defined as a right to use someone else's property for a specific purpose. Rights of way, however, are easements that grant the holder specific rights to travel across the person's land. So you can look at it that all rights of way are easements, but not all easements are rights of way. Right of way is something that falls inside the easement category. So let's look at some specific examples here. So for those of you familiar with the channel, you know that on the back of my 100 acres, I have a utility easement that goes through the back portion of my property. It is a buried natural gas transmission line. That's an interstate transmission line. So it travels all the way through the bottom part of the state of West Virginia and just happens to cross my property. The gas company does not own any of the land associated with that gas line easement, even where their pipe sits. They don't own that. But with that easement, they do have the right to have it there and to access it for maintenance. Now, on a side note, many of you have asked about compensation for that. Am I getting any money for the fact that that gas line is running through the back of my property? And the simple answer is no, I'm not. The way that works, all of that compensation was dealt with the previous landowners decades ago when the line was put in. There's no free gas. There's no benefit to me because that deal was settled with previous landowners. When I bought the property, I knew what was back there and I knew the, the terms in which that was done. Usually how that works when a new gas line's put in, then the gas company negotiates deals with the property owner. And it's my understanding here recently, at least, that it's based upon the number of linear feet. So the gas company is gonna cut a swath through your property X wide, then the number of linear feet of your property that they're going to use, then there's usually compensation there and it's usually in a lump sum. If they come back to do any heavy maintenance, they gotta let me know, or if they wanna come in and make any changes like access points to the utility line, then I have to be notified and I have to give them permission. So that's a pretty simple example of an easement. Now, you may also have power line easements where the only thing touching your property instead of a pipeline buried like mine is maybe there's telephone poles or electric poles or you, you know, electric stands, the larger transmission lines or the big crazy looking gantry looking things. That may be the only thing touching your property, but there's still a defined easement through that section of your property to allow that utility access. Okay, so let me show you an example of a right of way. Now remember, a right of way is an easement, but it's specific in the fact that it allows travel across the property, not just utility lines or gas lines or anything like that. So the easiest example that most of us encounter is a county road. So I'm here on our county road that goes past the front of my farm. If you look over my shoulder here, that's the majority of my 100 acres that way. If I spin around 180 degrees, however, bear with me, then you can see right here where this pole is, there's a triangular parcel of land that's part of my 100 acres. And it's ironic, because even I catch myself doing it all the time, that I think of these of, of this land as two parcels. Like there's, there's the majority, there's the, yeah, like 98 acres here, and then there's the two acres separate parcel. 
But that's technically not the case. This is one big parcel of land that simply happens to have a right-of-way easement passing through it. I literally own the land that I'm standing on, but because it's a county road easement right-of-way, then there's not much I can do with it. So what I do have the authority to do would be to cut these trees or cut limbs back or do whatever. I could even possibly plant a tree if I wanted to on the edge of the road, but I have to keep in mind that uh, the county road crew could come through and doing their maintenance, doing their mowing, those type of things, they could just simply mow something down, A, not knowing, or B, just assuming that, hey, it's on our, it's on our easement, we're going to take care of it. And that's one of the common misconceptions, especially when you look at rural uh, access roads, that a lot of people would look at this and say, oh yeah, that gravel bed, that's the county road, clearly. But the edge of the gravel is where it stops. So obviously the grass portion is mine and I can do whatever I want with it. Technically, again, that land could be yours. If it's a scenario like this, you'd own all of that. But the easement, those easements, usually extend well beyond where you see the road edge. And this gravel road here, I'm not exactly sure what it is. Uh, simply because I don't really mess with it. There's a, a hillside it's almost vertical there going down to my property. But usually it's marked off or recorded as X amount of feet from the center of the road out to an edge. You have center of the road that way and center of the road this way. So that's something you may want to double check. Sometimes if the state or county is very overzealous, they can say, oh, it's 15 feet or it's 10 feet or, or eight feet, whatever the case may be. They may go a lot further than you expect. Again, in a rural setting, not a huge deal. Now check with your local county or state code, but let's say, for example, instead of me owning both sides of the road, that this was my neighbor's property on this side. Well, technically, as far as ownership goes, he would own to the center of the road on his side, and I would own to the center of the road on my side. Again, really doesn't come into play until, with a rural setting, the county decides to abandon this road. Let's say for some reason, our neighbor up the road um, sold out, maybe sold out to me or my neighbor. We bought all the land to where the road is dead end, uh, comes to a dead end. And the county says, hey, we're not gonna maintain that anymore because you guys own that and your driveways are all the way down here. We're not gonna mess with putting a mile and a half of gravel down since you guys own that and there's really no passage through here. Nobody's coming through anymore. So we're going to abandon that road. If they did, then the ownership would come into play there. Then my neighbor and I would look at you know, that center of the road as ownership. Now granted, we wouldn't tear the road up because we'd wanna use it in West Virginia. You want all the roads you can get. Again, I can't stress enough to check if you're, if you're looking at a piece of land that has a county road passing through it, then just double check and make sure that that is the case. There could be a specific statement on the deed where maybe the county or the state actually purchased that land. Now, when you look at like state highways or interstates, that's when the government actually owns that swath of land. In fact, if you've ever traveled down a U.S. highway, a four-lane highway or whatever, you'll sometimes notice these fences that they have way out from the edge of the road, but they, they parallel the road for its length. And that's usually a good indicator of the actual easement width of that US highway or interstate. So it can be twice, maybe three times as wide as what they're actually using. But that's the land that's specifically owned by the government entity there. So what happens if you underestimate the width of the right of way easement through your property when it comes to a county road? Well. What we see a lot in West Virginia is actually happening right here behind me. So my neighbor just put in a new mailbox and his mailbox is technically sitting right on the easement. And if you wanna get technical, you can look at the code and say mailboxes have to be X amount of feet off of the easement and usually have a little pull out or turnout for the mail carrier to be able to stop and, and deliver the mail and safely get off of the easement. Well, here in West Virginia, where road edge is a premium and usually the edge of the road drops you off of the hill or into a large ditch, then a lot of people just kind of keep moving their mailboxes in and in and in. And even the mail carrier appreciates that because if he's like my mail carrier, he likes to try to keep a clean car and he doesn't want to drive off into soft areas where there could be mud to access the mailbox. What's interesting, and this is stories I get from my brother, who's a safety engineer for the state, the biggest issue when it comes to this is the, the plow truck in the wintertime ripping down these county roads and ends up taking out mailboxes because the width of his blade to keep it from going across the center line and maybe hitting somebody oncoming 
the width of his blade sticks out so far that sometimes he'll clean some of these mailboxes out all in one swoop as he comes through. Now another issue I've seen in West Virginia when it comes to mailboxes on easement actually can get pretty dangerous. And I have to confess that my grandfather was actually guilty of this. Uh, he's passed now, so I guess he gets a pass. But that was there for a while for some reason in this area and maybe nationwide. Comment below if it happened in your area. It was redneck chic to be able to drive around and take ball bats to people's mailboxes. So you'd come out one morning and the next thing you know, your mailbox is beat all to pieces. Like, did my mailbox get in a fight with somebody? Did it, did it offend somebody? No. Two dazzling country figures, usually in a pickup truck, were driving up and down the road, probably a six pack of something involved, and they decided, hey, for fun, we're just gonna beat the crap out of inanimate objects along the road. So my grandfather was one of such victims. I think he replaced his mailbox two or three times, and being a machinist most of his life and serving in the Great War fixing airplanes, he decided he was gonna engineer a trick to fix that. So he made his mailbox look exactly like a standard mailbox, but made it out of eighth inch plate steel and set it on a well casing post. So when you looked at it, it looked pretty unassuming, but the next time those turkeys came to beat up the mailbox, they were in for a surprise. I'd love to have seen the look on their face when they swing that bat and hit that eighth inch plate <laughs> and see the recoil come coursing back up their body. <laughs> that one had to feel great. But the dangerous element comes in when, you, when people do that, when they super build their mailboxes. And sometimes you see, for some reason in rural areas, people like to use the well casing or they find an old plow or some old farm implement and set their mailbox on that. And as they creep in closer to the easements, that becomes an issue. You know, not a lot of fast travel on this county road, but imagine a paved road with a mailbox leaning over and somebody just simply drops a tire, loses control. And instead of just taking out a small post and a little thin mailbox, they're hitting a piece of well casing that's sunk down in the ground five feet, or they're hitting a plow implement that cuts through their car and could obviously do some serious damage to them. So county road right of way should be pretty easy to identify and you know you can you can make some certain assumptions about the width so there shouldn't be any real surprises there. A situation with right of ways that I've seen in rural areas that make it a little more complicated are these examples where old farms maybe have family cemeteries on them. So that's where things can get a little weird. You imagine that somewhere on the property up on the hill up on top of the mountain i don't know why they always put them on top of the mountain my grandpa always said that was the closest some of them would get to heaven anyway they put these cemeteries up on the mountain and of course you have everybody buried there from the last several generations and if that is an official cemetery most likely there is a right-of-way easement from the county road to that cemetery so i've seen people buy these large tracts of land these old farms and have these cemeteries on them and be like, oh, that's a family cemetery. Uh, it's it's kind of nostalgic. It's no big deal. I'm not going to worry anything about it. And next thing you know, they end up putting a gate over it or they just tear up the road or, or do whatever, you know, build a barn across the road. And then 20 years later, when the next family member dies and they got the funeral home all ready to roll out there to start digging graves, they're like, hey, we can't get to the family cemetery. Or when somebody comes to put flowers on Papa's grave uh, over Memorial Day, they're like, uh, there's a barn in the middle of the road to get to the cemetery, what's up? Sometimes these rights of way for cemeteries are just implied or they've just been understood because this property may have been in somebody's family for, for centuries and just recently has been sold off. So the family may not even address it and never defined anything with the courthouse as a right of way. Now, if you're the landowner at that time, you have full right to tell people, no, no, you can't come in here, or we got to figure something out, but you can't do it this way. But you just got to watch. You don't want to be that guy that's keeping somebody from burying grandma beside grandpa so he can finally be, be together. You don't want to start that fight. So if you're going to buy a piece of land, rural land, and it's the potential that it has a cemetery on it, you really want to look that over. So you want to do your homework at the courthouse, and you want to do your homework on foot to walk around. Because sometimes the courthouse misses these cemeteries. And that may be worth doing an entire video on just by itself, the issues, the pros and cons of having a family cemetery on your property. So I wanna make one more point about utility easements, not rights of way, but utility easements, because there's, there's kind of a misconception, especially with the non-property owner when he looks at somebody else's property and says, oh, there's a utility easement right of way. I can use that to travel from point A to point B. The same with my gas line. The gas line, the pipeline, 
easement that goes through my property allows the utility service to maintain that gas line. And it does even allow them to have access to do maintenance and repairs as the needs come. So they can bring vehicles on, they can come in with their trucks, they can come in with uh, mowing equipment, whatever, to maintain that section if I don't keep it maintained. What you can find, however, though, is a local good old boy who says, oh, I can get my four-wheeler through there to be able to access point A or go through here and hunt and do whatever the case would be, or just out for a joyride. And they think there's some sort of right for them to be able to travel over that land. Even if there is a right of way for that utility easement that is restricted only to the specific entity that right of way is granted. So you could say that right of way is granted to the gas company. So gas company employees can come and access that land. But technically, gas company employees, when they're not actively working for that gas company, should not be on that land. Now that gets a little fuzzy because I'm sure some of you guys, and I've run into it too, where a gas company guy or electric company guy comes in and he find him hunting on the right of way. And he's like, oh yeah, I'm a gas company employee. I, I have a right to be here. No, you have a right to be here when you're on the clock and when you're sitting here working on the maintenance or repair of this utility. Not out here with your rifle deer hunting on the back of my farm. I've only run into that once in the 20 years I've been here. But that's something, as a landowner, you have to make sure you clearly understand how these easements are defined, whether they have rights of way and who they are restricted to. And as a landowner, you can obviously describe your own rights of way. Let's say you've got a neighbor who's got a piece of property that maybe hooks around yours, and you're going to say, hey, I'm going to grant you a right of way across my land so you can get from point A to point B, if you're a really nice guy. If you record that properly, which I strongly suggest you do, you could record that and say, okay, that right of way expires when my neighbor does. So it doesn't pass on to his kids. It doesn't pass on to his grandkids. When he dies, so does the right of way. All of that can be defined and will hold up in any type of litigation situation. But just be aware that when you establish something and it's used for a long time, when you take it away, then there's always conflict. So one more example about utility easements with rights of way. I've got a friend who is local, has 600 acres of rural Appalachian hardwood forest, beautiful land, but the gas company has a right of way easement right through the dead center of that. And it's a pretty nice road. In fact, it's a great way for him to get from point A to point B on his land. So he uses it just as much as a gas company. The problem is a lot of people in the area feel that, hey, that road is accessible to them as well. They either deem it in their mind that it's a county road or that that road's been there forever and I'm going to use it. So my neighbor has an issue where he's trying to keep people off of that road because it's his property and the right of way is restricted just to the utility company. So he then puts the burden back on the shoulders of the utility company, which is his right. So the utility company has to install gates. They have to maintain them. Unfortunately, he's dealing with some pretty overzealous individuals that when standard gates get put up, they come down and either, either jerk them down with a truck and a chain, or they even bring a torch and cut the hinges off of them. Seems like no matter how big a gate the gas company builds, somebody's always there to tear it out at some point. So, interestingly enough, what my buddy did, he has a dozer, he decided, I'm going to make tank traps. So he just took a dozer and he walled out a big swale uh, with a berm and put big boulders on top of it and told the gas company, if you want access, you got to figure out how to keep people off of it. Until then, you'll have to come in a different way. So the gas company, of course, that motivated them even more to try to figure out a way to bar access from everybody else, but still allow their trucks to come in. So easements and rights of way on rural property can be problematic at times. So you really have to do your research. If you're buying a piece of land from somebody and they say, oh yeah, there's an old easement over here somewhere, or so-and-so's got a right of way there, I don't really remember. Do your homework, get the details. This is where a good title lawyer is going to be able to help you out with that. Pay to have that research done at the courthouse. Pay to have that investigated because you don't end up buying a piece of property that has an easement that just blows it completely out of the water. Well, all right. Well, I hope you guys found this conversation useful. I enjoy talking about land and some of the unique uh, things to look out for when it comes to rural property. 
Leave a comment below. Let me know what you think and give me some other suggestions of what we can talk about with Lynn. All right, take care.